Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Marissa Rehor. Um, I'm the Transition Outreach Specialist at University of Wisconsin um, Whitewater Center for Students with Disabilities. So I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation. Okay, we can see it all right. Good. All right. Awesome. Okay, so just to start off, I'm going to be talking a little bit, just some quick facts about UW Whitewater. We actually have two campuses. So our main campus, which is located in Whitewater, that is a four year college. And then we also have a rock campus with which is a two year college. We are located in South Central Wisconsin. Our sizes for both of our campus, our main campus has around 11,000 students. And then our Rock County campus has around um, 1,000 students. UWW was founded 150 years ago as a teacher's college. And we're also known as graduating the most licensed teachers in the state, which is cool. And we're also known to have one of the largest business schools in Wisconsin. Some of the specialty programs we offer are marine biology, social work, media arts, games development, communication sciences and disorders, occupational safety, and a ton more that you could find on our website. So I'll be talking a little bit about the difference between high school and college. There is um, a big, big difference for students, especially students with disabilities. So in high school, the cost is usually free and college students will have tuitions, extra fees associated with coming to a college. Attendance in high school, attendance is usually always taken. The teachers always check their homework, they'll impart knowledge and they help the students learn. However, in college, sometimes professors don't always take attendance and homework might not be checked or graded. A lot of times in college, your only grades for um, a class will just be the tests you take. The daily grind is also very different between high school and college. So in high school, most of the time is very structured for students and the limits are defined by teachers and parents. However, in college, students have a lot of unstructured free time because they're in classes only a couple hours a day. So it's kind of up to them what they do with that free time. Continuing on the differences, in high school, students are in class six to eight hours per day. However, in college, they'll only be in class 12 hours per week. The study time is different. In high school, it's kind of whatever it takes to get a good grade. In college, professors really expect students to study two to three hours for each hour of class they take. Frequency of exams are different. In high school, students usually have tests and quizzes very often. However, in college, they'll only have tests maybe two to four times per semester. Academic standards are also different between high school and college. So in high school, passing grade will keep the student's seat. However, in college, the student will need to get a seat or better to keep their seat and keep going. And also their support team will be different. In high school, they usually have the same case manager for all four years. And when they get to college, they have to learn um, a whole new set of faces. So how do you access disability services? It's different from every college, um, but here at Whitewater, how you would access our disability services, you would first get admitted to Whitewater. Then we have you submit a application, which is found on our website. Along with that application, we do ask for disability documentation. So this could be a student's IEP, 504 plan, a physician's documentation. We also have been um, suggesting to parents maybe getting a online version of an IEP um, just so it's easier to submit. And then students may be requested to submit more than one type of documentation depending on their situation and their disability. So after they meet, they submit the application and submit documentation, they will get paired with a disability service coordinator and they will meet with them for an intake appointment before their first semester at Whitewater. And at this intake appointment, that's where they'll discuss disability documentation, accommodation, and you'll be able to get answers to any questions you have. So here at Whitewater, we kind of have three tiers of services available. 
So our first tier is our mandated services. So this has no fee associated with it. It includes our application, our intake and accommodation plan, requesting your services, um, our training on services, and then obviously the delivery. Our tier two is called our success services. So this could be pre-enrollment or pre-registration. We also have a fall orientation for all students um, coming in the fall and we train them on our disability services, how to access services. We also have basic training on our services. Um, we have basic assistive technology. And we, along with that, we have ongoing case management, um, which is with the disability service coordinators. And then our tier three services are called our fee-based services. So this is our summer transition program, project assist, adaptive transportation, employment connections, and out of class aiding. I believe I go more into those in the next slide. So something special at Whitewater is that we have fee-based services offered to students with disabilities. So our first is called the summer transition program. So this is a program of opportunity for incoming freshmen um, who register with our, with our disability office. Students will take two, three credit courses. They'll be able to live on campus, get familiar with our disability services, as well as get familiar with just college life in general, being independent and just the campus. Um, and this summer we're actually offering it online and in person. Um, so kind of depending how comfortable the student is. It's a really great program. Um, for academically and for socially, the students really get to meet people with other disabilities and kind of get to know people before they start um, taking classes in the fall with everyone. Our next fee-based service is called Adapted Transportation, which we call it Warhawk Wheels. So this is a pickup and drop-off service for on and off campus rides. So a lot of our students who are in wheelchairs will use this service. Um, we have big vans that will take them to their classes, to our local Walmart. And we also have the service for students with temporary disabilities. So let's say your student breaks his leg, they can come to our office and be able to utilize our adapted transportation. Our next is called Project Assist. So this is a program that provides tutoring services to students. This includes one-on-one -on -one tutoring, organizational tutoring and drop-in tutoring. Um, a lot of students utilize this program because it's very nice to have that one-on-one -on -one tutor that knows the class content. This tutor has taken the class before and they'll be able to really um, dive into what the student's learning and kind of have that one-on-one -on -one, um, learning style and tutoring. And then we have employment connections. So this program promotes and support undergraduate and grad graduate students with disabilities to help them engage in work, they help them find internships, and they help them with post-graduate post employment outcomes. All right, so what accommodations can students have in college and what can't? So these are universal to most colleges. Um, so what students can have for accommodations in college is they can have extended time on exams or quizzes, a low distraction room for testing, sign language interpreting. We have volunteer note taking where another student in the class will take notes for your student and the student will be able to receive those notes later on. We also provide in-class aids and we also have a whole bunch of assistive technologies. So what's not allowed in college is a modified curriculum. Students using notes or note cards on tests. We don't allow exam retakes, extra time for assignments. Uh, we don't allow modified assignments and no personal care aids that are not provided by CSD. So self-disclosure. In college, students are not required to request accommodations. So if your student does not um, disclose to our disability office that they either had an IEP in high school or have a disability, our disability, Disability Service Office will not know that they need accommodations. Um, if a student has been approved for services, they need to tell their professor if they want to use those services. However, the professor will not know what disability they have. All they will know is that they disclosed to our Disability Service Office and got approved for their accommodations, um, but they don't have to know what disability. 
the student has unless the student wants to tell them. So if a student chooses not to disclose to our office, the professors and instructors are not obligated to provide those accommodations. Students are also responsible for monitoring their own performance, attendance, or work. Their disability service coordinator or case manager will not have access to that. So it's kind of up to the student to really monitor how, they're, how well they're doing in their classes. All right, so I keep talking about disability service coordinator. Um, so at Whitewater, we call them DSCs. So what do they do? So each DSC has a caseload about 100 to 150 students. They help decide accommodations. They help set up the accommodation plan for the students. They'll be able to ask questions and refer students to on and off campus resources. They have check-in meetings with their students. They help students develop self-advocacy and independent skills. And they really like to focus on the student's strengths. Um, a little disclaimer is they do not monitor class attendance or grades, like I said. And if the students, the students are um, encouraged to reach out to their DSC. So if the DSC does not hear from the student, the DSC will think all is well with the student. The student is doing well in their classes. So really um, practicing those advocating skills for the students early on will help them um, be successful in college and asking for help. So these are some little tips on how to prepare for college. Again, begin practicing independent skills. Um, if your student gets up in the morning, uh, someone gets the student up in the morning, they don't use their cell phone to get up, maybe encourage them to use their cell phone alarm. Um, medication, if the student has someone tracking their meds when they take them, maybe having the student wean off of that and track their medication by themselves. Um, also begin to scale back on accommodations that aren't offered in college. Like I said, the modified curriculum, um, extra time and assignments, just so those students get used to the accommodations that um, aren't allowed in college, they'll kind of wean them off. And then learn how to study. Um, go over study skills with students. In college, it can be really stressful trying to study for an exam that um, is cumulative and that's through from the first part, first week of the semester to the last week. So really going through what study skills best fit a student will help them be successful. And then get to know the fun functional limitation of your disability. So have the students know what strengths, um, strengths they have, what are some challenges they have, how does their disability impact them in classes, um, really encourage them to have that conversation. And then practicing advocating and asking for help. This is really big um, in college. And we see a lot of students, especially students with disabilities coming in um, and scared to ask for help, but that's what we're here for. This is our job. This is our passion. We want um, the students to be as successful as they can be. So definitely encouraging them to advocate for themselves and um, ask for help when they need is, is really strongly um, recommended and will help them be successful. And then I always say start using organizational tools, planners, reminders. When I was in college, the first week of class, I was so overwhelmed with all the syllabus, all the due dates that the syllabus had. Um, and no one really told me to prepare for organization. So I was like, what do I do? Um, but then I reached out to a professor and they said, get a planner. And I've been using a planner ever since. Um, just having those organizational tools first going into first week of classes will help the student really um, get organized and especially with time management. And then if needed, connect with vocational rehab services in your county and see what kind of services that they could offer you. So these are just some cool facts about Whitewater. Um, actually in 2020, UW-Whitewater was voted the top five mobility friendly campus in the nation. Uh, they were, we were with a bunch of big 10 schools, which is kind of cool. We, in 2018, we were voted the best disability friendly college for online colleges. And then UW-Whitewater serves the most students um, with disabilities in any other institution in the state of Wisconsin. So get in contact with us. Um, I always say 
encourage students to tour our campus. Um, if they want to, you can tour our disability center. If you ever have questions, you can get in contact with us. We also have a Facebook page um, where we put reminders um, and we share different resources on there. Um, and we also have a survey if you want to keep in give us your information, we can um, get in contact with you if you would like to set up a meeting with us. And then I think the next is um, a great resource that I like to share out to um, parents and teachers or counselors. It's the opening doors to post-secondary education and training. Um, this is great for students can have a part to read in it, teachers, parents, kind of what it looks like. Um, post-secondary education, how to prepare students. And we also have the link to that on our, um, on our Center for Students with Disability website as well. So I believe that is it for me. Does anyone have any questions? Marissa? Yes. This is Tim, and uh, we have a question. Can you speak more to what the educational assistants in the classroom do for students? I feel like colleges yeah. don't typically provide this option. Um, the educational assistants, which do you know what they were referring to? I am reaching out through the internet to try to okay. discern. No, I don't. Okay. Um, hopefully they'll, they'll put in the chat. Someone can clarify. Up. Yeah, definitely clarify um, that. So I. Or I'm wondering if it might be related to clarifying in class aiding and the difference oh. you might provide in the classroom versus outside. Yes, so yeah, she, is, she responded. You. I'm sorry. I thought you said that there was supporting classes for students. So I think it's talking about what if there is an assistant in the classroom. Well, how yeah. does that how does that work with the student? What sure, what in class question. assistance do they get? Yeah, yeah. So um, students who, we see students who have physical disabilities are able to have in-class aids. So this is to help them with, um, if they have to get something out of their backpack or many times they help the student writing something um, either on a piece of paper or in some cases writing something on, um, writing notes for them. And then we also have out of class aiding. So that is, another um, accommodation for students with physical disabilities that need help with projects, doing stuff um, outside of the academic tutoring, if that makes sense. Um, and then I did mention we have volunteer note taking. So that is for students who struggle taking notes. Maybe their professor, um, they're worried about writing everything down that their professor has. So what this is, is another student in the class will take notes for them. And then we have an online portal that the student will scan the notes that they took. Then the student with the disability will be able to receive those notes um, at a later time. So they'll have kind of the whole notes that the class um, went through during the lecture and then they won't have to worry about writing down word for word. If that answers. Thank you. Yeah. They said that helps. Um, any other you. questions in chat or if you would care to unmute, you may. I am not seeing any questions coming in through the chat. I'm not seeing any little red microphones with arrows through them being turned into green microphones. So I think we're good to go to go ahead to Scott. And then we will, Marissa, I know that you'll be hanging out with us. So if you have questions for yep. Marissa, she will be here. So please feel free to think them through. I know some people take a little longer to get questions together. Ooh, and so maybe Scott, you could talk about this too, but a question just came in on um, any placement testing required for students. How are things being handled with the ACT scores and admissions? And I know there might be some differences between a UW school and Madison College. Absolutely. Marissa, would you like to speak to that first? 
Yeah, of course. So for um, this upcoming fall, the admissions office, if the student did not take the ACT, it wasn't against them. Um, they, it was kind of up to the students if they wanted to send in their ACT or SAT scores. Um, and then for the next fall for placement testing, the students can choose if they want to do placement testing, but how it is, is the school will take the ACT or SAT English score and then the ACT or SAT math score and that's how they'll place the students into the math or English class. So if one of your students doesn't agree with their score, thinks that they can do better, that's when they can do the placement test. And I believe the placement test is online um, too. So I don't know if you heard otherwise, Scott. Yeah, if yours is different. I that, yeah, I think the math, the, the tailwinds, you know, I think that is all, uh, is all online still. Um, great question. Um, there, is a, 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 there is a difference. Uh, Madison College does not require any placement testing, ACT for admissions. We require or suggest placement testing for placement in like starting in the right place in courses. So the way that it's going to work um, uh, in the near future and likely moving forward are you have three options. Students can provide an ACT score up to five years old. Um, students can take the placement test, uh, the AccuPlacer placement test, uh, which is what we offer at the college. Um, if they do take you know, for instance, if you're thinking about Whitewater and Madison College and you take the UW system placement test, we can work with you too. Um, and the thing we're really excited about uh, from an equity perspective is uh, we've been working with what's called multiple measures for about the last year and a half. Uh, and what that really boils down to is that we will take a student's high school GPA up to five years old and use that GPA for placement purposes. Um, without getting too deep and nerdy into it, and believe me, I can because I'm also, I have the great pleasure of being the director of disability services and testing, so I get to be a double nerd in these areas, um, which I love. Um, we have what are called crosswalks, so our math and English faculty have worked to look at GPA ranges and to actually have courses that are recommended based on those GPA ranges. So those are the three options we have at Madison College. And should I just jump in? Or are there any other yeah, questions? Go, yeah, why don't you just go go keep going there, Scott? All right, thanks, Tim. So uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have the chance to speak with you all tonight. Um, I, I've got two screens going, so you're going to see me kind of looking at this and kind of toggling back and forth. So I hope I don't make you dizzy. Um, I have had the great pleasure of working in disability services my entire professional career, and I and I love that. <laughs> I'm so lucky uh, to do the work I do every day. I've been in, I've been in uh, the field since 2003, um, was at MATC for a decade working on direct service, working as a what we call a disability resource specialist, um, uh, the same the service coordinator, a DSC, like you just heard, uh, similar to what Whitewater uses. I was in that role. Uh, then I had the pleasure to go be a Warhawk for two years and, and be the associate director in the Center for Students with Disabilities. Uh, I had a wonderful experience and had a chance to work with many of the same, many of the programs uh, you saw you saw tonight. It's a fantastic institution, um, truly the flagship in the state of Wisconsin, and I cannot ever, ever, ever speak highly enough of how great they are there. Um, wonderful team, wonderful leadership. Um, and then I had the, the great pleasure of having the chance to come back home again uh, and come back to Madison College when Sandy Hall, my good friend, mentor, and prior boss, retired in 2015. So since 2015, I've had a chance to, to work as the director uh, at Madison College. And then in 2017, uh, uh, the director of testing and assessment retired. So they gave me his gig as well. So um, it's with great pleasure I had the chance to speak with you tonight because not just of what I just mentioned and my whole life is in this area, but I am uh, a sibling of, of, a, of a brother with significant disabilities, uh, including several palsy and blindness and, and autism. Um, Matt is 38 years old. Matt lives in a group home in Green Bay. He's, uh, he and my mom and dad are the reason I do all I do. Uh, so I, from, from on a personal and professional note, I want to just say thank you to everyone who's here tonight, everyone who's listening, to Tim, um, to Linnea, uh, to Linnea, to Marissa, to everyone. Um, that, that's then whoever, whoever I did not mention by name, thank you. Because truly what you do is remarkable. 
uh, and you give us the opportunities to, to do really great things. And I can't emphasize how important that is. So my presentation, um, you're, I'm gonna go through, uh, some slides I'm gonna go through, uh, kind of pass over because Marissa uh, was awesome and covered some of the things that, that um, I normally cover. I'll, I'll reinforce things, take questions about those, but I'm gonna focus on just a few uh, other things that I think will really enhance your time with us tonight. Um, the slide you see on our screen defines our work. We are truly in the business of being storytellers and it's the greatest job in the world. Um, because every person has a story and every story has an author and because every person is a self-author, we get to help students figure out how they're gonna tell their story. And that's like the most important thing I can think of. Um, the preface to this is as, as, as Spider-Man once mentioned with great power comes great responsibility. And when you write your story, you both have great power and great responsibility. And tonight I think we're gonna empower you with some tips on how to, how to be that self-author. So when we talk about transition, I wanna emphasize that when we talk about transition, it, it's not something that happens over the course of a summer. It's not something that happens over the course of a year. It's something that happens over the course of a lifetime. Uh, and in each new situation we go into, whether it's starting at a community college and with the intent of graduating or just taking a class or with the intent to transfer, um, uh, there are so uh, many pieces to transition going into the world of work. Um, so many changes we encounter in life. We prefer to really look at transition as being holistic. And when we talk about transition, it's not just about that DS office. And what I mean by those two letters is disability services office. It's greater than just, um, transition's greater than just what a college can provide as related to transition services from the disability services office. It really truly is a village. We look at transition as encompassing program and services information across the college, campus tours, transition events, whether it's an event that we hold, which you'll see some things later, or something like, um, uh, you know, like the, the, oh my gosh, it's slipping my mind, uh, forgive me. The one opening horizons, the wonderful transition event, uh, and that Whitewater offers in the spring, transition events, regardless of where they are, are incredibly valuable. So, uh, be, you know, uh, early and often would be my advice. Career exploration. You'll hear me talk about more about this in a minute, but really starting with what am I good at? What do I like? Are they the same? Are they different? And let's find a starting point. Um, Application assistance, that could be from financial aid to applying to a college or university. It could be an application for supplemental services. It could be an application for project assist or Warhawk wheels. It could be all these different pieces, right? Getting um, uh, assistance with understanding the applications and filling them out, that's transition. Um, and then help with registration, right? Now that can come from a number of different sources. But again, when you're thinking about what is transition, really try to broaden your perspective in terms of all the things a college offers a student in terms of the student experience. Um, most of these things uh, Marissa mentioned, but uh, I'm gonna just hit on a few uh, that I think are really, really important. Develop your interests. Um, you're gonna hear me talk about how gaming and other things can be really good, um, but really develop your interests. And um, to be honest, like I use Minecraft, even, and, and Minecraft is legendary and immortal and will live forever. Um, it truly will. Fortnite and other games have taken over some of them from my primary real estate, but but I love talking about Minecraft, not only from a, a perspective of like being able to self-regulate and like not just game all night and be ready for college, but there are like so many different career paths that Minecraft like is associated with in my mind, whether it's design, whether it's um, things like paying attention to small detail, creative, um, there are so many things that gaming or interests really connect to in terms of career. And I'm gonna challenge you and challenge teachers and everyone else involved to figure out how to make those connections because I really believe that they are critical. Prep those study skills. Get ready for whatever that next step is. Get ready for writing that paper. Write that five paragraph paper. Get ready to write that paper with two resources. Get ready to start studying and end studying on your own terms, in terms of when you start and stop. Don't rely on other people to set the watch and tell you when you begin and end, right? 
um, be, develop some of those independent living skills. Work on reading, writing, and math. I'm gonna share some tools that can help with all of those areas. Um, if reading is a barrier for students, find a tool that helps you with reading and, and learn to love it. Because um, I guarantee if you find the right tool to help you read, you're gonna love reading because it's amazing. And it also will help you with everything in school. Um, Self-advocacy, right? That can be, and we'll talk more about these anchors that I, I, I set aside in a second, but being able to attend your IEP meetings or 504 meetings, be active, work with DVR, um, apply, get, you know, get, get an idea of how DVR could fit into your educational or your, your, uh, your employment uh, goals, because sometimes they connect. Um, contact colleges, take a college success course. I'll talk more about this later. And lastly, but not least, stand in your awesome truth. Be comfortable standing in your truth and being who you are, because you're awesome. And with that, get ready and get comfortable asking for help because believe it or not, um, there are so many supports in college that are so different than high school and the experience is different. And we wanna help you to stand in that truth and be the awesome person you are. And sometimes to get there, you gotta ask for help. So get ready for that. It's really important to do because there's, a, there's this really big study called the National Longitudinal Transition Survey. And I'm not gonna bore you with the details of a survey except one question they asked. And this was from their second wave back in 2011, but it was a really big sample size and it's really important. They asked 11,000 students, all who are students that went to college. And they were individuals that one year graduating from high school were surveyed. So they went to college for a year and they were asked a bunch of questions. They were all individuals with disabilities. The question among many that they were asked was, do you have a disability? And when a student has the chance, when they go to college, as Marissa talked about, to make that choice of do I seek services? Do I ask for help or don't I? In this survey, when asked the question, do I have a disability? Do you have a disability? 55% of the students said, no, I don't. Another 8% said I do, but I, I, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't get any help. That's really important because if we can work on that piece of standing in your truth and understanding that it's okay to be a person with a disability and it's okay to, to understand that this, this disability defines a part of you and not all of you, if we can kind of get there and start moving there, that percentage will be a lot lower. And the more and more students will graduate and more and more students will be successful and more and more students will be comfortable realizing that they're awesome. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, the differences between high school and college, we talked about that already, but truly, the, the, when you look at the differences in the laws, the law that protects individuals with disabilities in, in K through 12 is called the IDEA or the IDEA law. It is, an, it is a success-based law that basically allows school districts to, to once they, and it gives school districts a very important job, figure out who the individuals with disabilities are in your district and provide all the supports necessary for them to be successful and graduate. That's where sometimes the differences between high school and college come in. Because in college, the laws change and it's an access-based law and not a success-based law. So the two really big changes are, number one, most of the accommodations you can get in high school, you can still get in college. But accommodations that might change the test or change the paper, change the experience, those aren't allowed in college. Um, and the other piece is that, and the most critical piece, as Marissa did a great job outlining, is that we don't know who students are unless they come forward. That's why I started with that statistic, because in that survey, given the choice of I'm now driving the bus and no one speaks for me and I can decide whether I have a disability or not, I'm going to say no, because you know what, this might not be the coolest thing to feel. It may not be the coolest experience I've ever had in my life. And maybe, just maybe, I don't really like feeling this way or being identified this way. Um, unfortunately, if we don't know, we're not able to help. But here's the really cool piece is when students do come forward, we are able to engage with students to help students understand that, that when they work with us and use accommodations, they start driving the bus and they really get to show who they are and show what they know um, and that they don't, and in fact, 
can become everything that they've always thought they could be and have the college experience they've always wanted to have. All you have to do is ask for help. It's not easy, but we're there once you ask for it. Other big differences, grades, as Marissa talked about, it's not, there's not a lot of points in college. Um, there are more, there are, and I should say like a lot of homework that's graded to get a lot of points, like what we would consider worksheets or busy work, maybe in high school. Um, in college, you're gonna have a few tests, probably a project or two um, and a paper, and your grade's gonna be based on those things. And if you don't do well in those things in high school and you have points, you can kind of balance your grade out, right? But in college, it's a little bit different. So it's really important students understand that um, you, you should be aware that even though you might have two chapters to read in three weeks, and there's no like, no one's asking you if you read it, you better read it because you have a test on it that's gonna really um, impact your grade. But that's where the personal freedom piece comes in is having an understanding of that um, and understanding that, um, that there are these differences and really kind of taking ownership of them. Um, the idea of advocating, um, in college, students are provided accommodations, but they do have to identify to a professor or to an instructor and say, hi, I'm Scott. These are the accommodations I'm gonna use. Now we help with that. We can help a student with an email or coach or practice because that's scary. That's why my case managers are here to help with that. But Students got to do it. So we'll cross that bridge together. And the biggest piece is structure. No longer, yay, or is it the eight to three, Monday through Friday, locked in a building, right? Kind of a thing. We work with our students to understand you might have two classes a day, two hours apart, and what you do in between makes all the difference in the world. You can turn left and go to the library or the Student Achievement Center, the Writing Center, or you can go the other way and go hang out in the den and play 8-bit Nintendo and probably see me there. But that's a different story entirely, or Tim, but that's a different story entirely. Um, so that being able to, to, to be ready for that, that you're driving the bus. No one's going to know whether you go left or right, and it's up to you. That's a piece that we all can get ready and prepare for. Um, I already talked about this. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to move past this. I'm going to just speak for a second about um, some of the functional barriers in my mind and my experience with ASD in transition. Um, more and more uh, students uh, that we work with at Madison College are individuals that are identifying with, with, with autism based disorders, spectrum disorders, communication um, disorder, uh, and, and kind of connections with other uh, disability related barriers. So I wanted to emphasize this for lots of different reasons, considering this awesome audience I have tonight. When you think about that slide about what transition is and how broad it is and all these pieces, it's really important to look at the slide and say, okay, if any of these barriers in social communication, if any of the barriers of, of, the, of Asperger's or of an autism related disorder could um, impact the ability to complete those steps in transition. And, can, and, 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 and if there are any of these connections as related to being able to, you know, explain behaviors and, you know, um, we, we need to talk about these things, right? Because school is interactive, right? And the classroom is an interactive place. So the more my team and my, my team of experts understands like strengths and limitations as related to being able to regulate emotion or understand emotion or communicate or recognize sarcasm, <laughs> right? Uh, like those things happen in college. And if we know about that, we can work to provide supports and context to help understand what might be next. With that said, I mentioned this before, what are you good at? What do you love? What do you spend all your time doing? What are you obsessed with? It's not a bad place to start in terms of a career because that's what you pretty much do for the rest of your life when you work is you kind of work on something and you, and you kind of obsess about it and you do it for the rest of your life. So you should be good at it if you can be and you should be moderately interested in it if you can be. There are jobs and careers that center around these things. I use a brief example of a conference I presented at to a group, I mean a hard crowd, a group of radiography technician educators <laughs> wonderful, wonderful program, wonderful field, tough crowd. And 
I said, so I started out and I said, you know, I've been looking at some of your job descriptions and it looks like you need individuals that are able to do something that seems relatively boring, like, but to some people might be fascinating, like staring at x-rays, looking at something for a really long period of time and being able to do that and understand and pay attention to detail and being able to understand the differences between this and this and see those differences. I said, I've got like 30 of the best job candidates you ever will ever interview in your life. And they're all individuals on the autism spectrum because what your job requires is an exact fit for the strengths that many of the students I work with have. So let's get creative because um, that could very well be something that not only an individual is good at, but they really like. And guess what? I see connections and looking at, I mean, I don't know. I can see the, the ability to Minecraft away bit by bit, literally for hours, paying attention to the detail in a five foot by five foot space. That's radiography, just saying. And I have on there esports because Madison College is home of the inaugural first year we had an esports team we won the national championship. Esports is real. Uh, this has been totally underemphasized uh, and uh, flown under the radar. Madison College has a full blown intercollegiate esports, competitive esports team that we won the national championship in an all real season. The days of saying gaming doesn't matter are gone. The days of saying gaming can't help people make social connections and make an impact at college and maybe have a career, that's yesterday, right? Um, and I mentioned that not just because Madison College is awesome, but because there's other places doing the same thing, right? There, these opportunities are growing. So if you're a gamer, stand in that truth. So these three boxes are really, really important because what they, if you, and I'll talk about them each briefly, but what they really all, both individually and added up, what they equal to is the college experience that students want to have. On here, it says successful transition. I could erase that and say, the college experience every student dreams of having that wants to go to college. These three boxes can add up to that. So here's what I mean. Let's start with the technology box. So it truly is a matter of two types of technology students have to master. Marissa did a really nice job talking about some of the educational technology. Whenever I present in person, I do the, how many people do email? And I get one hand and it's parents or teachers, right? And all the students are like, oh God, that's my hand. And, but, but the reality is, is that for everyone over 18 years old, that's not in high school or below, we do email more than we'd like to every single day. And if we don't do it, we're not successful with our job or our college or whatever it might be. So you got to get used to, you, you got to know what the tools are colleges require you to use. So email, 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 even though you might not use it, you got to be able to take a selfie of yourself and email it to someone. It's the first thing I have my classes do when I teach it, because that shows me if you can attach a selfie in an email, you can attach a paper in an email. If you can attach a photo, you can attach a paper. Tim, I'm not going to go dodgeball. If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. I'm not going to go there. I know you want me to. Online classrooms, D2L, Blackboard, Canvas, whatever we, uh, what's the, I think there's a new one that UW Systems now using. Online classrooms are used at Madison College in 85% of our classes in line or in person. Assignments are posted there, homework is submitted there, grades are posted there. If you don't know how to use that environment, it's not possible to say the online classroom ate my homework. It's not, you, it just, it's just not, you won't be successful unless you can master those skills. So you need to get an idea of, of be re, being real with yourself about what am I good at with these things and what do I need to learn and what, what does the college or the employer or whatever I want, wherever I want to be next, what are they going to require of me? The other piece is assistive technology. And, the, and so Marissa talked about accommodations we provide in college. Assistive technology is a big part of our mission at Madison College, and it's also a big part of, a, a big part of what Whitewater does and things are the same as they used to be, which I think they Assistive technology, helping with reading, helping with writing. If sitting down to read a chapter takes you three hours and you don't remember and understand a lot of it and it feels terrible and you don't feel very motivated after it, 
What if I were to say, if you spent a half hour with me, I could teach you to use a tool or literally turn that same tool on your phone that will read everything on the screen to you and highlight it so you can hear it and see it. Students that use that kind of a tool that struggle with reading understand and remember 75% more than normal. When you use your eyes and your ears, two senses at once, really cool things happen. What that means is time. If I can spend an hour and get out of it what I want to get out of it and leave that feeling like I've learned something, not only am I going to be motivated and not only is my attitude going to start changing about what I can do, but what, and then this thing starts happening in class and you, because you start being able to show what you know. The other thing that happens is instead of spending three hours, you spend one. And now if you budget your time correctly, you can do the stuff at night you want to do socially and have all the fun you want because you'll be able to get the studying done and get much more out of it. If you stand in your truth, you use the accommodations, trust me, please, it will change your life and it will change the way you look at what's possible and it will change the way that you, like literally it will change what you're able to accomplish. Like it will change everything. You just got to ride with me on that. Trust me on that because I've seen it happen over and over again. Other kinds of technology, um, we use uh, cell phones a lot. And whether it be like talking a text message, which, oh, by the way, you can use that same feature to talk an assignment and say period new paragraph, and it will dictate and do all the punctuation and things for you on your phone. And that little magical box with the arrow, you can email things to yourself. If writing is a struggle for you, you can use a fancy program like Dragon or you can use your phone. If you talk text messages, you can use that for school. It will save you time. It will change it for you. Um, personal leadership really relates to advocacy. It relates to things I've already talked about, but what it really comes down to is that slide I mentioned about planning. Like when, when I'm talking about like um, being ready to know who you are, know your strengths, know your barriers, ask for help. If you have an IEP or a 504, write the agenda for your next meeting. It could be a cool starting point. Um, community building. Research shows that when a student is involved in just one club or organization on campus, one fun thing, they graduate at a higher rate and they have a higher GPA. That is truth. We have like 200 clubs and orgs at Madison College. We have the anime club. We've got the 8-bit gaming club, the 16-bit gaming club. Uh, we've got so many different types of clubs. And if we don't have it, we can start one. I started with some of my former students, a fantasy football club. I was terrible at it. I also started a Wolfpack film club. Both of those were students that were individuals with autism that I was their case manager. And they were like, I want to do this. And I was like, are you kidding? That's awesome. Let's do it. That makes a difference. Students with disabilities have less social capital than their peers, which means when they're in a classroom and they're in an environment, if you can imagine a spider web with all those connections, individuals with disabilities, particularly those that impact communication and social interaction and those pieces don't have that same cachet. They don't have that same amount of connections. Our job is to get students to connect to those things. So as Marissa mentioned, the case managers that I have on, on my team, um, their job is to not just provide accommodations, provide support, provide coaching when it comes down to it, but to also get students connected to the other pieces that we know are like so important. So I've talked about this, talked about that, talked about that. A couple of really cool community pieces. Uh, I want to emphasize honor societies just because it's fresh. I know Whitewater has a chapter of Delta Alpha Pi. Madison College has a chapter of Delta Alpha Pi. That is a college honor society for students with disabilities. And oh, by the way, it's harder to get into than Phi Theta Kappa. And I will tell that to Marty Krabs, our Phi Theta Kappa advisor, every time I see him. 3.1 GPA and 24 credits earned is what you need to be eligible for this honor society. We had 300 students at our college with disabilities eligible for that this year. 
And, it, and we do a formal induction every spring to induct individuals into this honor society. Um, it's a national honor society. Uh, we were the 113th chapter, I believe, and I believe we're getting close to 135 or more chapters nationally. When I, that's one of my favorite days of the year. And when I stand in front of that group of very special people, parents, grandparents, students, I ask the question, how many of you, is this the first honor society you might've been in? And most of the hands go up. And when I say, okay, keep your hand up if you never thought you would be in an honor society. And most of them stay up. What I'm talking about tonight that leads up to this example is what we do to flatten and level the playing field. So students know you can be in an honor society in college. Like that's not impossible. It's actually more possible than you, than you could ever possibly think. You just got to take that step and stand in your truth and come hang out with us and get to know us and let us, let us get to know you so we can help you. So Scott, I know you yeah. still have some bullet points to go, but we do have some questions that I'd I think we can to, go I'd ahead and move to. to. Yep, if I'd be happy to. Yes, yeah, so what I'd love to do is get to questions and then I do have to come back and talk about my last two slides about gaming because I think it's really important to show a couple of quick things that families and parents can do in terms of games that are already out there. Ooh. Like these safe spaces to fail, these ideas like you can like, you know, um, uh, so yeah, so if I get time, do you, do you, do you want to go through those slides really quick? Why don't I do that? If that's okay, uh, uh, yep, and yep, that, yep. I'll talk more about it sometime. Okay, do 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 do. We have so many cool things at the college. I didn't even get to it. I get so excited. I apologize. We have a billion resources for our new for all of our students, including some um, really incredible. Um, specific services for individuals with disabilities. For individuals with dyslexia, we have specific math and, and dyscalculia, math and English uh, learning disability instructional center. We have a new trio position that's just meant to help students finish college with disabilities. It's awesome. So um, you got to come talk to me and talk to us more and figure out all this cool stuff. Okay, so The Sims. It's kind of old school, but I want to emphasize The Sims 4, which you know I have on my Xbox. Um, and I think it's on Game Pass, so it's free now. Um, the Sims in and of itself is a way for a person to create an avatar and, and, and by controlling this avatar, experience success or, or a lack of thereof and kind of just live, if you will. Now, with some add-on packs, particularly the, the going to college add-on pact, um, mm -hmm. students actually work to help their Sim graduate from high school, apply, be accepted into a university, then they live in a dorm, and they like live there for a year in the game. They have a chance to, to go to class, not go to class, join orgs, not join orgs, go socialize, all-nighters, right? You know, don't barely shower. You know, if you played The Sims, it lets you do kind of funny, weird things. Point being, personal leadership and community are addressed in this game. Um, and the student has a chance to have a safe space to fail. And that's the most important thing I want that I can I can connect to this concept, which is practice matters. It's why the summer transition program is so important at Whitewater. It's why we want students to take college success before they, you know, if they are, are trying to take steps towards college, we have lots of opportunities. Safe spaces to fail are important because they allow a student to try something and try it again and try it again and try it again until it works. The Sims can do that. Fortnite creates social stuff creates the ability to work in small groups and problem solve, right? And to work together. Um, ultimately, like being able to make mistakes and then learn a strategy to correct the mistake to get the points to pass the level, right? That is a real world skill, right? You got, if you can learn that you got to adapt to get to the next level and you can't, if you don't adapt, you can't get past it. That's college. That's life after high school. So there are like very, very real connections to some game, not all games, um, but some games really provide an opportunity for students to practice. Um, so with that said, love to take some questions. Cool, okay, so the first one up is, does Madison College offer assistance such as a person uh, for individuals with executive functioning disabilities, like could be related to autism, 
for supporting change in scheduling, et cetera, like each semester? I mean, there's a lot of changes that happen at college. That's a really good question. So um, we do, you know, we work with all of our students on, a, on a, an individual basis, number one. So what I, so I don't want to give a blanket yes or a blanket no to that question. Um, what we would do is we'd look at what those needs would be. We would see what existing college supports like case management, uh, so the you know, trio supports, our special needs instructors, what, you know, what's out there that could help meet that need. And if there is still unmet need, okay, what else might we be able to do? Now, what we don't provide is an actual executive functioning coach. We don't have that kind of a role. We don't have an ability to provide that as an accommodation per se specifically. But I believe that when we look at time management and organization, there are probably some other, um, some resources that we can kind of stack to kind of meet that same outcome, but we do not have that specifically. So can I just, you know, talk and- Yes, Teresa. Like, yeah. Um, Hi. As, hello. Um, so like my son, he's like gonna be a senior next year. So, but he really, really wants to attend Madison College. Yeah. It's like his dream now that we've been talking about it. Awesome. Yeah, um, it's pretty awesome. So um, he also is receiving a very high level of support from DVR okay. for job placement. And he receives a very high level of support in high school um, okay. currently. So, so like in class support, like in the classroom kind of support? In class support like and one-on-one -on -one pair of support with all of his homework, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking sure, about. Sure, 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 sure. So, so like for when he's in jobs, like for example, this is kind of what I'm talking about. He would need somebody in a DVR, like then they pull support back once he's in, used to the, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, That's so like supported of, employment, like a job coach, like, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, queuing and coaching. Um, so we can't provide that level of, uh, broad, let me just speak broadly. Broadly, generally, we can't provide that level of support, but I, 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 I would like to talk to you more if that, if that's okay. Like maybe offline I, and I can get you. Yeah. Tim can I get sent you, you an email. Already. Would, I already. already. You an email. All right. I'd love to meet with you. We want to like get together. We want to come in for a tour and all that with masks. We're already vaccinated. We're all set to come. Um, so yeah, let's talk. Awesome. So again, right, like that, that's the biggest takeaway is that it's easy to say, to talk broadly about what is, what is and what isn't allowed, but ultimately it's, it's our value system and our legal obligation to have an interactive case by case conversation with families and students to, to be able to understand, even if we have to deny something to really be interactive, to best understand if there's any possible way we can say yes. So we have a couple more um, questions in the chat and then I see Nancy has her hand up. So Nancy, I'll get to you after I, I do the, the chat once that we're in here. Um, so does Madison College or University Whitewater provide assistive technology for students? So I can speak uh, and I would, I probably could feel comfortable speaking for Whitewater if it hasn't changed that. Uh, in my experience, yes. Uh, so at Madison College, we provide the software, whether it be adaptive software for reading or for writing. We provide the software and training at no cost um, and, and help students and support them through using those tools. Um, if students use other um, high level, um, like augmentative communication you know, technology or other pieces, um, in some cases we may have existing inventory or be able to order some things or we'll work with a student with their existing hardware or if they're, you know, um, working with, you know, ERI or some other you know, community-based organization and getting an ATE valve, that would certainly be a part of the conversation. So we do provide a lot of it. Um, sometimes we can't provide all of it, but we'll figure it out. Marissa? And that same for Whitewater, as Scott said, we do provide um, the program as well as the training delivery for the program. Um, so we use what's called Kurzweil, which is um, a system that the students will have on the computer. It could read out the uh, books that they have. Um, we also have smart pens for note taking and assistive um, note taking technology, which again is a program that the students can get on their computer. Um, so that's all programs, no fee associated with it that the students can receive. Yeah, and another thing too is that like this thing right here um, is invaluable. How many of us you watch YouTube to figure something out? 
for our hands-on programs at the college, we encourage students like in culinary to take a video and go home and watch the video over and over and over again to figure out how to make that cut or make that sauce or, you know, for me, boil that water. You know, like watch it over and I mean, again, <clears throat> what students have in their hands and they're kind of permanently attached to is where we like to start because if they're used to it and it's where they spend a lot of time, likely they're going to use it. So the next question is, I've noticed that college resource centers are asking more for psychological evaluations, medical documentation, sometimes more so than an IEP or 504 plan. Yeah. Can you speak to what you are looking for in terms of documentation of disability? That's, that's, that's a fantastic question. I'll speak specifically to Madison College because it is different institution by institution. And I'll try to answer it as quickly as possible, but I'll, I wanna give you a good answer. The reality is that um, we require documentation from a qualified expert. Um, if that person is qualified to provide us with information about a disability, um, that's where we start. Um, generally, we like that information to be as recent as possible and to, to provide as much information about the barrier of the disability, the strengths and kind of accommodations that might work for an individual. That's, that's, that, that's where we like to start. Now, what I want to emphasize is that that is not where we get stuck, okay? We prescribe to what's called a shred of evidence model, a student's story and their life experience is just as important and validating as a piece of paper. So we look to have information from experts. It could, it, sometimes it could be an IEP or a 504, depending what's in that IEP or 504. We may need some additional information. We might not. Um, ultimately, the, the biggest thing that I can suggest is that you work with whatever college you're going to to figure out what they need because it might be a little different. Um, we, regardless of where a student is with having documentation or not, if they are able to share their story, we are able to start providing provisional accommodations for that student and work with them to get the information they need, need to, to maybe say use those accommodations past a, you know, in future semesters but we will never at Madison College use a lack of documentation as a reason to not serve a student. And you, I'm being very passionate about that because I cannot emphasize enough from an equity and inclusion and an anti-ableist perspective that uh, we need to meet people where they are and, 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 and we are legally able to serve them wherever they are. Yep, and I know, like you said, this is different from different institutions to institutions. So you're really gonna have to check with your disability resource service for that college to make sure that you understand what the requirements are. Um, Marissa, what's an example at, at Whitewater? Yeah, so at Whitewater, we really um, just like to see the diagnosis of the student um, and then why, what's the need for accommodation? Um, again, but what Scott was saying, that's kind of, that's not the barrier. We do like to do an interactive process. Um, that's why we meet with you before you start at Whitewater to really figure out what would work best for you accommodation wise. Um, even if you don't have that documentation to support, it's just nice to have um, for our end. But again, interactive process, not a barrier. Uh, we try to kind of meet you where you're at. Thank you. And Nancy, you are up next. Thanks, Tim. Um, I just got, first I've got a comment and then I have a question for Scott. My comment is, and Tim knows this, that I have a 42 year old gloriously autistic son who became the first person they ever knew of to graduate from the UW Madison with a full blown autism diagnosis. How's, how is Matthew? He is fine. Did you know him? I did, Nancy. I, you and I actually have met a couple of times. It's been a while, but you knew Sandy Hall pretty well. And Sandy, yes, yes, friends and, and mentors in the world. So thanks for attending tonight. And uh, you've taught me a lot. So I just got to say that. <laughs> well, I just wanted to mention someone asked about resources for executive functioning. Mm -hmm. One thing that helped Matthew was we actually hired someone who was a special ed student at the UW to um, be like an executive function coach. And for a couple hours a week, they met with him 
to figure out what might be a problem. And then there was a team mm -hmm. working on to solve these problems and that person reported back to us. So consider um, you know, a win-win situation like that where you're helping someone who is a peer so that what we considered it happening is we outsourced or Matthew outsourced the executive functioning help rather than saying he needed help. It was like he hired a secretary to help him with this. Okay, my next question is, um, Scott, since you're, are you the new Sandy Hall? I am, I've been, I've been. Oh, I would love to spend some time with you, but uh, the Autism Society before the pandemic hit yeah. was, has an awesome social group that does outings once a month. And one of the things that Sandy did for us was have a, a weekend you know, a meeting of a couple hours where she talked about all the stuff that you're talking about, but there was no Minecraft. There was no other kind of gaming thing that was happening at that time. Would you be available once the pandemic lessons and stuff to do something like that again? Absolutely. Nancy, are you hijacking Transition Talks Tuesdays for the purpose of Autism Society of South Central Wisconsin? Hey, Nancy. Oh. I love Nancy so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not hijacking them. I'm just doing a little bit of chat, you know, here and now. So uh -huh. asking. Nancy, I'd love to talk more with you. I would love to. Um, and I still have breakfast with Sandy every once in a while and Tom. And uh, All I'll, right. I'll give them... Uh, your best and drop me an email. I'd love to chat with you. Okay, I'd love to get your email. Is that in the, the chat somewhere or? I can put it in there. I'd be happy to. That would be great. You bet. And I want to also emphasize that um, <laughs> yes, you can be, once you get, and I'll put my email in there and I have, and I'll also put the DRS transition email, which is we have a dedicated staff person who works just with all of our new students district wide in terms of all the next steps. Um, so there's lots of other really cool connections that, that I can get you connected with. Um, and, and we have, you know, I'd be happy to talk to anyone as much as, because there's, you know, lots of questions as related to well, how community college can fit in. So I'd be happy to talk. And speaking of lots of questions, um, I don't see any more in the, uh, the chat box. If you do have a burning question, feel free to, to raise your hand. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to, very politely allow people to leave if they would want to leave. Um, please take note that there is an evaluation form in the chat box. And with that, I am going to stop the recording and then Marissa and Scott, if you just want to hang on for a little while more, we'll see if anybody else has questions. Thank you So all. Tim, I do have a little wrap up. Yes, Linnea, wrap it up. <laughs> Almost forgot about me. I did. <laughs> all right. Well, first of all, thank you, Scott and Marissa. That was um, really a great presentation from both of you. And it gives me hope with an 11 year old on the spectrum. It gives me a lot of hope. So thank you. Um, Tim mentioned about the survey. So we got that. All the presentations are going to be on YouTube and the transition talks Tuesday. So if you missed part of it or you missed some of the other ones. Um, yep. Go ahead, go ahead and go on to YouTube and it'll be available to you. And just to remind you that this presentation was brought to you by Tim and the Children and Youth with Special Needs Care Transition Tuesday website. Go, Tim. <laughs> All right. That's, that's and, a mouthful. That, that's a yeah, lot of words. And yeah, we hope to see you again. When is our next one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. May 11th. May 11th. There we go. Guardianship and supported decision making. So. We hope to see you May 11th. Thank you, everyone.